We love shooting, hunting, and educating. So if you want to learn about long-range shooting, you're in the right place. This is the Long Range Addicts Podcast. Shooter ready, stand by. Hey, everybody. Welcome on this fine Wednesday evening. Appreciate y'all joining us. Um, you know, this has been one I've been trying to get on for a couple of weeks. And because I am the biggest procrastinator in the world, I can't ever get Ryan to join us because he's always got something else to do because it's usually the night before and I suck at it. So here we go. We're going to talk to Ryan at Graybo tonight. Um, first off, I want to thank our sponsor, Benchmark Barrels. Um, they've been sponsor from day one. Appreciate them. Again, new carbon fiber barrel lineup uh, is out. Uh, go check it out, benchmarkbarrels.com. Um, you know, with the carbon fiber craze going along, there are quite a few new barrels out, but definitely don't overlook the benchmarks. Uh, next is Long Range Tactics. Um, make sure you go to the new Long Range Tactics website. It is live. There are some reviews on there. One of the reviews is uh, the entry of the Gray Bow Phoenix. So go check it out. Uh, Justin Hires doing a full review on that. He's actually taking it hunting. Um, putting it through the ringer, testing it, you know, you know, giving you a full uh, review feedback of it. So make sure you go to longrangetactics.com and, and check that out. Uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Mr. Ryan McMillan. How you doing, Ryan? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad I can finally quit procrastinating enough and I gave you like, like 13 hours instead of yeah. four hours notice to try and do this. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So let everybody know. Now, a lot of people have heard of Graybo. It's been one of those name staples that's been in it. I first really started dealing with Graybo back when I was at Voodoo. Um, Voodoo ordered a massive shit ton of Graybos because they loved them so much. But kind of tell everybody what Graybo is and how Graybo started. Well, um, after I sold McMillan Firearms in 2013, I kind of had uh, some time to, you know, think about what, what I wanted to do next. And um, there was a, a project that, um, you know, I kind of got into making stocks in a, in a more efficient way. Um, so I kind of started messing around with that and playing with it and, uh, you know, still doing kind of the epoxy, you know, I, the, the history with McMillan. And so we were messing around with epoxy and, and trying to figure out how to mold a stock in a different way, a little bit more efficient, maybe a little bit less expensive. And so just messed around that for a while, determined that it was a viable business, um, that we could make stocks. There's a lot different about the way traditional stocks were made, like the hand laid up, but there was some similarities so that we could hold, we could hold on to that as kind of like what we know a little bit about what we know. And then the rest of like, like new territory. And so we ended up, you know, uh, taking that to a point to where we, we got some interest. Our first customer literally was Remington. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's a, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, of course. And so uh, we really were just drinking out of the fire hose at that point. And so at that point it was like, okay, we have a business and uh, let's, let's pursue it. And so we basically invented a new way to make composite stocks, um, I did a lot of research when I was uh, developing this process and there is nobody out there in, that I could find any molding company. I'm not even talking about just stocks, but any company who does molding the way we do it. And so um, we really just kind of had to start from nothing and just work through the problems until we found something that was, that was reasonable. I mean, the first stocks we made, I mean, I wish I could, wish I had them here. I mean, they were just garbage, total, totally terrible. You know, I mean, there's just so much that goes into molding stocks, so much nuance um, that goes into molding stocks. Each process is unique. And so um, that's kind of, you know, a down down and dirty story of how we got into business in Graybow and what we did to get there. And, and, you know, for the last five years since we've really been in business, I mean, just continuously trying to improve that process, make better products, stronger product, lighter product for a good price, continue to, to give the customers that, that great price that, that we saw in the beginning, like this process could really lead to a better way of molding and, and, and ultimately a le less expensive way of molding rifle stocks. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's how everybody starts. I mean, you're, you're going to start with kind of a, a limited, you know, 
knowledge of how you're going to do it and build on it. And you guys, yeah. I think in the, in the short time you guys have been around, you've built a really great name. Now, a lot of our listeners are going to notice one thing and it's your last name and that's McMillan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- there is a lot of, of rumor and a lot of things I've seen in a few groups lately about, Oh, Graybo is part of, you know, the McMillan thing, different things like that. Can you kind of explain the backstory to these listeners so that they kind of understand where Graybo is in, in the whole aspect of the McMillan world? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning, we, we didn't really know how the relationship was going to work out between Graybo and McMillan. Obviously, my dad's Kelly McMillan. He owns uh, McMillan Fiberglass Stock. So obviously, there's a connection. Um, we didn't really know in the beginning how if this was going to be a separate company, if it was going to be related to McMillan at all. We didn't know. As we went along, um, really, when we started working with Remington, we realized we needed help because that was a lot of product early on. We kind of worked with him and talked to him about maybe coming and, and, and work, uh, working with him on at least getting some help to get to the next level. I mean, we did that for about nine months, and we realized that after that nine-month period that um, it, it wasn't going to work out to where Graybo and McMillan were going to be a, a team or a part of, you know, a, you know kind of working together. Um, uh, they did, they absolutely helped us in the beginning get kind of over that hump of, of getting started. Um, but, uh, and, and there was one article that was written while we were um, kind of still figuring that out. And I think a lot of people still spread that article around, which is, it's fine. But <clears throat> at this point, there is no connection between McMillan and Graybo. I mean, they're totally separate companies. Um, we have nothing to do really business-wise with that company. We have a different facility. We stand on our own. We're completely different and, and unique in, in the way we do things. So um, I don't know how else this, it's pretty simple, actually. I don't know. I don't want to overcomplicate it. There's just no, there's no relationship there anymore. Um, other than, you know, there was a short time period where we kind of leaned on them and they, they allowed us to, 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 to help us over that initial hump where we were doing, we went from making three stocks a day before we had any business to doing, you know, uh, 50 a day for Remington or something. So. Yeah. And now how has that affected you guys with Remington going away now? Now I, I, I guess I shouldn't say Remington going away because somebody bought Remington, but yeah. How has that affected your guys' bottom line? Well, geez, I, I could talk about that for a long time, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, in 2017 was our first full year in business. We started, we did a little bit of work in 2016, but 2017 and the end of 2016 is when Remington came on full full bore, and we did a lot of business with them in 2017. When you're new business and you, and you get a contract like that you're all your eggs are almost in one basket right i mean your volume is is with them and then they go out of business in 2018 or they they file for bankruptcy and we didn't things just were a mess with them and they didn't we didn't do any business with them for basically two years so what we had to do is we had to you know we built our infrastructure around the volume that um, they were providing us in 2017 and then in 2018 when that dropped out um, we had to build a new customer base and that's when we really started getting heavy in uh, working with Red Hawk and we brought on Voodoo at that time and we brought on Alamo and a couple other companies um, to really fill that gap and we worked really really hard in 2018 that was a hard year for us because we had spent the money to build the infrastructure to make certain amount of stocks now of course you know that there's risk when you take on a big customer like this early on so you're you're willing I guess to um, assume that risk, and, and you know about the risk, but you, you you're always hoping that that risk doesn't materialize. And for us, it did materialize, but we were able to work through it in 2018. And and I think in a lot of ways, looking back, it was good for us because we really it really forced us to get out of that OEM, you know, that big OEM bubble, and really get into kind of you know, talking directly to the customer, selling directly to the customer, selling to, you know, reaching out to smaller companies like Voodoo being one of them. And uh, at the end of the day, it was good for us, but it was a tough, it was definitely a tough year, 2018. And that was solely because of uh, Remington going from, you know, what they were to now what they are, which is almost non-existent. Right. Yeah. And that was one of the big things. I worked for Remington 
I don't even remember when my last year was because that was the first time that I'd heard about Graybo. And as I, I held up this stock right here, now you listening on the podcast aren't going to be able to see it. But this yeah. was the original AWR stock, which this did come on my AWR. Um, it is off because I've taken pictures of a bunch of other stuff, but it always goes back on there when I'm done. Um, but, you know, that was a crazy thing. At Voodoo, we bought so many of them, and that was beginning with the one back here behind me, the, uh, what is it, the, um, uh, what I can't remember what Voodoo called it. Uh, it's the Ridgeback. So, oh, Ridgeback, yeah. Yeah, so they had their own name for it, but... Um, you know, I've had a lot of great, you know, success with the gray bill line. Now, one of the big things, and I kind of wanted to talk about that and I'm going to pull it up here. And that is, let me see if I can scroll down here, the Phoenix. Now the Phoenix is your newest one. Um, now this is cool because we noticed this today, the, the Phoenix review from long range tactics is up here. We appreciate that. Um, this is the initial one. But tell us a little bit about the Phoenix and kind of the market you want to kind of corner with that um, with that stock. Yeah, well, I think let me um, tell you a little about, about our process up to that, and then I'll talk about the Phoenix. But, you know, we launched the um, Outlander and the Renegade. They're very traditional stocks. Um, our molding process in the beginning was really kind of what we built our company around and really needed to be refined. You know, when we built the Ridgeback, um, that was really like – the first step out for us. So like it was a really unique stock. And we had a lot of really good feedback from that. And that's what I wanted out of this company. We built the terrain because people love that style stock, right? The terrain, people just traditional. It's kind of got that vertical pistol grip and that hunting style of just or um, elevated comb. But then after that, we knew like, <clears throat> let's get back to what we did with the Ridgeback and let's get unique and okay we, we know our process we're good at our process now like we know how to make stocks better than they always been all those traditional stocks that have been around for decades there's better ways to do them so the phoenix was really our our stepping out moment like let's make this so different that people can't ignore it let's take out everything that doesn't need to be there and let's put in everything that does and let's make it light, you know, and, and let's put it in a segment of the market that is, is desirable. So this long range hunting, lightweight, long range hunting, there's not a lot out there in suit in, you know, in really lightweight long range hunting because mostly, you know, adjustability causes, uh, costs you weight. So if you have an adjustable cheek piece or an adjustable length to pull that costs you weight because the hardware is heavy. But the way that we started developing some of our, and designing, not development, in the design phase, how we designed our, our cheat piece, um, as I think it was uh, Justin who did the review and he, he pulled the cheat piece out. And uh, in that review that you have there on, on the website, and he's like, it's, it's simple and it's light. It has almost no hardware in it. It's the same with the, the uh, uh, length of pull. It's really lightweight stuff. So we could develop a stock that took out all the extra weight in the geometry of the stock make the hardware so that it was lightweight. And then now we have this stock, this really unique stock that's unique to us that um, fits in a really good niche that's needed and, and comes in like a half a pound lighter than anything in its class and hundreds of dollars less. So we were, I mean, honestly, we were just so proud of this stock. Like we really are so proud of this stock. This was a, a real step forward for us in our evolution of stock making. And so, we got a little confident, a little, I don't know, overconfident, whatever. This next stock we're gonna do, I can't really talk about it here, but you'll see it and I would say the next month is even a little bit farther of a step forward of like, holy cow, this is really different. So we're just trying to push the boundaries. We're just trying to eliminate the things. And what I always tell my guys is this, you know, if we're gonna do something, there's gotta be purpose behind it. So if we do something unique, like the, like the buttstock end of that Phoenix, if someone asks about it, you have to have a reason why we did it, not just to look cool, but why did we make the buttstock look uh, the way it did? Well, because we saved about six to eight ounces when we, you know, carving and molding that section out. We saved a lot of weight and it's functional. It's not just to look cool, it's not just to save us, uh, to, to have that curb appeal, but it's, it's to save us weight and it's functional. So, 
long, I guess it was a, kind of a long winded answer, but I wanted to make sure that everybody kind of understand it, stood the evolution of how we got to the Phoenix and where we're going. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of companies are, are, you know, still trying to build around the basic stock, you know, putting the comb on it and everything else. And this truly is different, you know, and I haven't had the chance. I think I saw I, I saw one at uh, the, the Night Force ELR, but I didn't play with it as much as I should have, you know, and, you know, talking to Justin, he's been extremely, uh, you know, the feedback's been nothing but good about it. And what Ryan kind of said is is hit, hits home. When you put adjustability in a cheek piece or anything like that, it usually adds a lot of weight because you've got metal, you know, whether it's a KMW hardware or however other hardware runs it, it's a lot of weight. But this system takes a lot of that weight out. And um, I, I don't know. I haven't tested the balance of it yet. We'd have to ask Justin. But um, how does the balance work in this rifle with the stock being as light as it is? Do, can you balance it as easy or is it kind of front heavy or what do you think i guess that depends on you know the rifle that you're using i mean the yeah. longer the, barrel, the heavier the barrel yeah it'll be it'll be uh, heavier in the front um and that's a you know that's a decision like not every stock is built for everybody you know um you know you try to get the weight where you can in the right places but there's only so much that you can do to take weight out and i know that in the hunting game probably the most important attribute to a stock is weight um, at least nowadays, it didn't. Use, it's hard to say. There's a group that doesn't care at all about weight, I think, and then there's a huge group that cares a lot about saving weight. Part of the reason why you know some of the carbon fiber barrels have been so popular, they're so much more expensive than the old traditional barrels, but almost everybody's running them because weight does matter. Right. So you know um, that's something that you just have to try out for yourself, specifically on your your firearm, and see if it if it works for you. Um, but I don't think you know. I don't think there's going to be, you know, I don't think there's going to be a problem. You know, when you, when you go out and hunt and, um, you know, I think that if weight is your number one concern, um, I think you can over, most people can overcome the, you know, if it's a little unbalanced in the front. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to give your guys kudos, kudos right now. Cause I'm just playing on the website as we're going through this and you guys have, have got a lot of great pictures. And now I know some of these pictures were from Hannah. Um, I can tell Hannah's pictures, um, yeah. She used those. She does a great job. But there's a lot of questions that are answered on your guys' website. It's amazing to me how many freaking companies put stuff on their website and then give absolutely no answers to it. And then people are chasing their tails for a month trying to figure out exactly what it is. So so kudos to you. So um, you. there is a feature section, 32-ounce stock, which is holy crap amazing, um, especially with the adjustability. Uh, the vertical grip, which I like. Now, there aren't a lot of people that like the vertical grip because of their hands. I've got giant meat hooks, so it's easy for me to run a vertical, and I love it. Plus, I'm into you know shooting precision, so I don't really run my whole hand around it, which really makes me like the vertical grip. I've just done that. The barrel contour, inch to inch two fifty straight, um, and I do want to bring this. So quick, the Gomery foam recoil pad. Now you kind of showed me this the first time at the night for CLR. And to me, it was one of those things that I was like, holy cow, this thing's awesome because there's a lot of recoil pads out there, the Pack Myers, you know, those. But to me, this recoil pad just felt different and it was soft. Um, it feels really durable. I've had issues with some of the other ones coming apart. So that's one thing. Uh, if you're going to watch for this Grable stuff to, to cross little things that they're doing because a lot of people don't pay attention to the little stuff, but the little stuff gets me excited because it, it does show me that there is some evolution here. Like Brian explained. Um, now it, you only fit 700s. Do you have any idea of building it into any others or is yeah. that kind of the direction you're going? Yeah. So, um, we're working on the Tika right now and, um, because of our molding process and the way that we built our molding process, we rely pretty heavily on the mold itself to create most of the geometry, even on the inside of the inlet. So, what we do, and what we what we what we do is that we make a stock with no inlet in it, and then we machine it out in the very beginning. So, like for the Tikas, we'll make the stock 
with no inlet in it and machine it out until we determine that there's enough volume that we can make a mold. Because molds aren't cheap. Uh, we make our own molds, um, so that's good. Um, we can make a mold. We, you know, once we have the the drawings, the design, we can make it within seven to fourteen days, and so we can move pretty fast um, on that. But we don't always know what the demand is going to be, so we want to before we. Um, you know, invest in a mold. We want to make sure that the demand's there. So that's kind of the process of, of that. I know some molds are upwards over a hundred thousand dollars. So it takes a while to, to pay well, for a lot of that stuff back. Yeah. And so molds like plastic injection molding, yeah, those molds can be extremely expensive, but the way that we mold, um, our molds aren't nearly that expensive. They're not cheap, but they're not expensive. Um, and uh, I can't really tell you exactly how much they are because we make them and I don't really make them for anybody else. So I don't really know the, I mean, I know the cost of them, but I don't know what I'd sell them to other people for. But, uh, you know, they, they, they're they not nearly right. as expensive. So we, it's, it's worth it for us. I mean, we don't have to sell a ton to make a mold. We just have to make sure that we're, we're making a couple a day or something like that. And if we're making a couple a day, then it's probably worth making a mold for. It makes our it makes our process much more efficient. You know, to put a stock on a on a machine on a CNC machine is it's cumbersome. You know, and there's there's room for error. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's the biggest problem. And um, I see is just the room for error of the inlet. Once you you know, for us, we mold, all the Remington stuff we mold in all the inlets. And yeah. once you have the inlet right, <laughs> it's right every time. One of the biggest. Uh, things that we get from our OEMs, one of the biggest um, things that they like about our product is that our consistency of our inlets because they're molded in. And so um, that's uh, that's something that, that we like about the molded in inlets. But again, we, we just have to, we have to make sure that the volume's there for us to make a mold for it, you know, dedicated mold. Yeah, and I, I can probably answer this question, but maybe you can see at the end of the screen or the bottom of the screen. Do you have any plans to implement an arc rail on the bottom of your stock? Um, so for the for the composite stock, so we have one chassis, by the way, so that's why I'm prefacing this. For the composite stocks we've been talking about, you can attach uh, some arc rails you can attach to an M-lock. So like for the Phoenix has two M-locks that run on the bottom, and you can attach uh, an Arca some arcos will attach right to the M-locks. So um, that's about as far as we can go. We can't really build one into a composite stock any, any more than that, any more than just allowing for the, uh, you know, for the attachments. Um, so like the Ridgeback to uh, the Ridgeback, people run arcos on the Ridgeback all the time and they just attach them right to the M-lock on the bottom. And it's the same setup as the Phoenix on the bottom. Yeah, and, and a lot of them, like the Area 419s and stuff, utilize the front, um, the bottom metal screw on the on that. So then it can be really rigid, especially because, like on the bottom of the Phoenix, there's two sets of uh, m walks. So yeah. you can have one heck of a strong bond there. It would almost be good, just as good as having it built in, in my opinion, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so is there anything else we want to go over the Phoenix before we jump on to the next? I'll try and get on to, um, if I can figure it exactly here, to your chassis. Cause I want to, there it is right there. There's Doug too. Um, so, um, is there anything else on the Phoenix we need to talk about? No, no. I mean, uh, one other thing I kind of mentioned is that the grip is hollowed out. I mean, I think it's cool that I think we're probably the only one, only composite, you know, um, epoxy-based stock company that does that. Um, we did it because because we wanted to save weight, and we we're like, why not, right? Just because yeah. nobody else has done it doesn't mean that we can't do it. So that's another thing that that we did that kind of took a step out and said, why do we need the entire grip filled with composite? We don't. Let's hog. It. Let's. We don't hog it out. It's in the mold, so it molds around that. But. Uh, I think that's unique. So when customers buy it and they get it, they're going to look at that and probably at first be a little shocked because they've never seen a composite stock that has a hole um, built into the uh, into the grip. But it's intentional so and to save weight. And it's, you know, once you get that thick in composites, like you're not doing anything for strength. So 
So how, let me ask you this, I guess, before I jump on, and I know we had a conversation about it a while back, but I want everybody else to kind of understand it. Now you guys have tested the, the, the stock thoroughly for rigidity for, you know, how long it lasts, everything else. Um, you don't have any issues with cold or, you know, because I know there was, there were some other issues in the past with a couple of other manufacturers that there were some, some issues there. And so if anybody is out there on social media or anything and they see certain things like, Hey, there might be an issue with this. How would you go about, you know, letting them know that there, there isn't an issue here? Well, we do, we do test all of our stocks when they come out. Like, so especially if it's a stock like the Phoenix, you know, it's, it's really lean. We want to make it as light as possible. And when you're messing with composites, you know, when you're trying to develop a stock that's light with composite, you're always kind of moving the toggle on, on the lightweight and then your toggle on the other end of strength is moving the other way. Right. You, 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 you can't, I mean, you try, you can maximize both and that's the goal, but you never know until, uh, until you actually break it out of the mold and test it. So um, we do that. And, you know, when we, what we do is we lay carbon fiber. So kind of the part of the process is we lay a lot of carbon fiber into the uh, mold itself. And then we have the epoxy that strengthens it around it. Um, and so what we do in the beginning is we don't know exactly how many strips of carbon fiber we need to put in there. Um, uh, to make it rigid enough so that it, it can go out and perform in the field. So oftentimes we'll put a minimum amount in there that we think might work and then we'll strength test it and oftentimes break it. And then we'll go back and say, okay, well, let's add another strip. And, and we'll do that until we feel comfortable that the strength is, is adequate. And so um, that's how we, we test it. The other thing is our material. We, um, we have a materials formulator that um, we've been working with since the beginning. Probably one of the most important things we do in our business, one of the most important relationships we have, and one of the most important things, like like the, our, our material is our stock. It's our whole business, right? So it's important that that material is formulated properly and formulated by a professional, and not just formulated, but mixed. So when I say formulated, that's the math. That's all the the, the chemistry that goes into all the you know molecular uh, the molecular molecular bonding um, during that uh, thermoset process but also the mixing matters too. So anyways, this whole process we've been through in a long time. We don't mix it by ourselves. We, we have a professional team who does all the analytics, analyzes all that, delivers it to us. We just end up um, uh, molding it. So um, I think we've got a pretty good process for consistency and strength um, for our stocks, but we absolutely 100%, we want, especially when we're trying to Get a stock out that's lightweight. We want to get it out of the mold and we want to test its boundaries. And then we want to increase the strength where we can, which means we'll increase the weight a little bit. And that's okay. We, we know that we're playing this balance here, but um, we, want to, we want to keep the, the, the weight as light as we can, but we want to increase the strength so that it's, it's um, durable in the field. Okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, that'll answer a lot of people. Like they're going to go, you know, well, it's this light and it's hollow, like you said, and they're worried about durability. How is your warranty on that on, well, any of your stocks, but how does your warranty system work? Well, <laughs> what it says and what we do, what it says is the stocks are, are, are guaranteed for life, mm -hmm. but basic wear and tear is not, is not, uh, um, like negligence and stuff is not accounted for, but we've never once asked a customer to like prove it. Like if you have a problem with your stock, we will replace it. I don't even, you don't even need an excuse because, you know, I mean, there's 99% of the people out there are good people. They're honest people. If 1% of the people out there are really just trying to, you know, I don't know, get a deal, screw us over, whatever you want, however you want to call it. It is what it is. It's fine. I lose 1%. It's definitely worth those other people, the other 99% who really have a problem or don't understand or what something's going on. It's definitely, what I found is it's worth, it's worth taking care of everybody, even the ones who you think might be trying to, trying to get a, pull a fast one over you. So you have a problem. I don't even care. It doesn't even matter. You call and you say you want to send your stock back. We're going to replace it. It's just that simple. 
Yeah, and I kind of wanted you to to kind of come out and say that. I knew you guys kind of had that that idea, but a lot of companies don't do that. You know, once you buy it, you just have it, and that's something to me that you know would make me want to definitely go buy a gray bow just because you knew you had that peace of mind. Like, you know, if I'm if I'm an idiot and I do something wrong, at least you know I can call you and say, "Hey, I'm an idiot and I did something wrong." But yeah, and that's we encourage you. To say, tell us, like, if, if you did something that, like, caused the stock to, like, break or something, ran over it, um, we're still probably going to replace it. <laughs> I mean, like, we want you to, as a customer for life, one stock is not that big a deal. Like, we want you to buy three, four, five, six, ten stocks, whatever. Like, we want you as a customer for life. And if it, re if it requires replacing a stock that was your fault, that we, I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but it is what it is, right? Like, we put that on our website, on the warranty, just what do they say? To keep honest people honest, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you call, we're going to, it's just that simple. Yeah. So you heard it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Greg will take care of you. That's all we need to know. So let's move on to the next, the Neo. Uh, so th there's a lot of chassis out there. There are a ton of them, just like there are a lot of stocks out there. What, what was your idea behind the Neo and what do you kind of want to accomplish with the Neo? We wanted to make a, a, a chassis that was an entry level chassis for people who didn't, who'd never used. There's a couple of things. Entry level chassis for people who never, who had, who wanted to get into chassis but didn't want to spend 1,200 bucks on a big clunker. Not that that clunker is a bad word, but these chassis are big and massive for these PRS guys, right? Somebody who was like maybe a hunter who just wanted to, you know, wanted to get into the chassis game. We also wanted. It, we leaned it out and made it as light as we possibly could. So when we designed it, um, we knew we were going to make it out of aluminum. And so we designed it so that we eliminated as much material as we possibly could. So we could make it light enough so that people could feel comfortable. If they liked chassis enough, they could hunt with a chassis. And so we did all this. We, we put it in. And, and also, we made we wanted to make it so that it was, a, again, a reasonable price. There's a lot of good chassis. Well, there's a number of good chassis makers out there. A lot maybe is too extensive. But there's two, three, four, four good chassis makers out there. And they're really good. And I don't think we, we really want to compete with them when it comes to PRS stuff. I mean, that was not our, our goal initially to get this stock out there and try to compete there. They have a lot of experience making stocks for that. We felt that this was an area of the market that was untouched. No one was really making an entry level chassis that you could shoot at a match, that you could go out and hunt with, that you could go point steel with, that was reasonably priced, that was, and it was lightweight and it felt good and all that, all the stuff that you kind of want as someone who's getting new and, you know, maybe into PRS or new into hunting or, you know, that's what we wanted to hit. We didn't see anybody doing that. And so one of the reasons too, that we got into the chassis business is when I started Graybo, I knew I've always known that I wanted to be able to manufacture stocks with molding processes, with composites. And I also want to be able to machine them machine stocks um, with aluminum and other materials. Um, so that was a big deal for us to be able to have two completely separate processes in which we make product. This is a, it, it, to us too, it's a long-term strategy because now we can build on our, on our, um, what we learned from the Neo and we can get better at making chassis. We can, same thing with the composites. We can get better at making composites and eventually those two, I think those two disciplines will merge into some really cool product later on. So from a business standpoint, it was there was some strategy behind it because we knew that we wanted to be able to have that skill set in-house and to be able to move fast on it and to be able to eventually combine that skill set with composites down the road. Probably giving too much away, but that's okay. I but I, you know, sitting here thinking about it, I'm like, I think you're the only one that I know of that has both, you know, there's, yeah. there's chassis companies and there's stock companies and they do exactly, you know, that's the line they've gone down. And you guys have kind of been one of the first ones that I know of that have gone down the road, you know, both, um, you know, MDT has a chassis and then they've got that new, the XRS or whatever, but it's not a molded, uh, you know, stock like you guys have. So, yeah. To me, you guys are kind of setting something, you know, a new standard there, I guess. Well, we, you know, I don't know, it was a personal goal for me to be the first one to do 
truly do chassis and truly do composites. It was a personal goal for me because I thought nobody's doing it. Everybody stays, you know, in their in either chassis or composite. And I just thought there's there, you look at both. There's benefits to both. There's no doubt. There's benefits to both. Like so, where's it? Where's the where's the industry going? And so it, again, a personal goal for me. I just wanted to be able to do it. I wanted to have the skill set to do it because um, when we get down the road a little bit, I think doors open up when you're able to have more uh, uh, capability in house. And so when we can, we have the ability to to machine these stocks. We have the ability to mold the stocks. Now we have this huge opportunity to make stocks with more capability than any uh, than anybody else. And so. We just need more time chugging through um, different products and then customer feedback. And then like, and it eventually I think here in the next few years, I think things are going to be, you know, I'm really optimistic about the company over the next couple of years as we want. Let me just finish by saying this. I wanted to make sure that the foundation of this company was strong before anything. We've been around for five years and I think we have a pretty good brand. But my number one goal was that our foundation, which is our manufacturing capability, was solid. Before we really expanded out and did all kinds of crazy marketing and, and sales, we're finally getting to the point where we're doing, we're really doing sales, we're doing marketing now. But for a long time, all we did was focus on our on, on building our, our manufacturing capability. So I think that's my that was my kind of strategic plan going, you know, from the start was just be good at making things in the beginning, and then once we can do that and do it consistently, I think that'll be the key to our success long-term. So you won't give us any, uh, any um, ideas of what you're working on next, huh? Well, the next one out a composite stock. Mm -hmm. um, I've already, I've already said the name of it. Not that that gives anything away. So the name of it's the Trekker. And I will say that it's a hunting stock. And I will say that it's super unique. I'm sure people will look at it for the first time and go, WTF. <laughs> but that's what, we, that's what we want in a way, because we want people to go, what is that? And then we say, this is why we did it this way. This is why you haven't ever seen it. Um, and so I, I'm excited about it, quite honestly. It's, it's almost a challenge to see how unique we can make things and but have a functional reason behind them. Yeah, and I, I I've been I've been in with a few dealers recently, you know, just kind of talking about some of my client stuff. And uh, that's one thing that I try to do is I go to try and talk to people and see exactly how things are changing. And one thing that every dealer is telling me is that uniqueness is selling more and more. You know, it's not the same stock that you can see on a line of rifles that looks exactly the same. It's the being able to go to the range and being unique and having something that works and, you know, having something that's your own. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to see how this, uh, how this is. It's going to be interesting to see. I, I did pull this up. Now you guys just did release this. This is the Hunter DBM Remington yeah. 700. Tell us a little bit about that because it piqued my interest when I saw it. Yeah, so we had this idea, we've been working on it for a while, to create a DBM that was acceptable for hunters. And biggest couple big concerns about a standard DBM for hunters, first of all, they don't need five rounds. So well, typically, hopefully, you don't need five rounds, right? Um, and, you know, it's a snag hazard for sure. So the magazine's a snag hazard, and it can be loud, um, especially if you have the metal mags. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create kind of this hybrid between the BDL and a DBM to where a hunter felt comfortable taking that out into the field and hunting with it. But also when he gets back to, um, you know, to civilization and he goes to the range, he can stick his five round mag in there and he can turn that same rifle that he hunted with and felt comfortable that he wasn't going to get hung up or, or, or some animal was going to hear him. Um, he could turn that into a range gun and, and, and pop a five or 10 round mag in there and go at it. So that was our goal with that. And uh, I think people really like it so far. I mean, it's, you know, it's the DBM world's interesting. There's only so much you can do to make things different and unique. But I think this definitely was one of them. And so we'll see. Um, and, you know, we, um, 
the, the good thing is that uh, we we sell a magazine with a three round magazine. It's a plastic magazine, um, really good, reliable, uh, made by Ruger, and uh, it, it fits up in there nice and flush. You know, won't snag on anything, and so. Uh, that's the five round that you're showing there. That's just a metal like AI mag or something that you see there. That's just showing the capability of you being able to take out that sh smaller round. There you go. That's that Ruger mag. That's uh, um, basically you know snag free. You can see the trigger bow is not you know it's rounded like the BDL. So if you know you get like a branch or something, it's not going to catch and hang on. It's going to slide off. And um, it basically the profile looks like a BDL with a with a you know, with a, a mag, a three round mag box um, sticking out of it for the hunting guys. So what's the biggest? Well, do you have one that fits like a 28 nozzler or are they just standard lengths? Uh, how, how do you, cause you've got, I looked on lengths, it's got short and long. Mm -hmm. What's your long? Do you know off the top of your head? The long is, well, there's the, 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 um, the long action, and then there's the CIP long action. I don't know the dimensions off the top of my head. There, I know they're a hundred thou different. Um, I think it's. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter actually. Like three thirty eight Lapua is fine in a long, but then I'm not sure what calibers are CIP like. That's just some. That's something you'd have to check with um, the manufacturer of, the, uh, of your rifle or that ammunition um, to see if it's a CIP length cartridge. And so we probably, I have to, I have to talk with some of my guys whether or not we have the CIP in development or not. I mean, we do have the CIP length in the, in the standard DBM. I can't remember if we decided to do the CIP in this or not. But anyway, the long is anything from basically 338 Lapua and down, or, or the long and the short, what we can do with, with the long and the short, 338 Lapua and down. Yeah, um, so it'll fit nozzle, or it'll fit all that then if Lapua fits. Yeah, CIP is yeah. usually a little bit longer. And a lot of people don't in my experience, don't do that. And they should, because everybody's trying to seat their bullets out a little bit further and everything else. And that's kind of yeah. why I was wondering what your lengths were. So that's interesting. So for you hunters, this is going to be a good option and it looks good too. I mean, that's, that's one of the big things is I, I've got an internal box mag or it's a, it's a BDL internal box right now on my 28 nozzle and it feeds like garbage. And I've been trying to, find a different way. And there are a couple different um, choices out there, but for this price, that's phenomenal. $159. That comes with the magazine, with the three round magazine. No. So it's just the BDL. And then the magazine is how much more? Uh, $37.99. Yeah. You're still less than, you're still almost half of, of some of the others that are out there. So yeah. that, that's a good option. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think we're the lowest. There might be one other company that's lower, but I mean, uh, I think we I think we fit in a pretty good range for what we do. We don't see one of the things about our company when, early on when <clears throat> when I started the company. One of the things that was important to us is that we were able to deliver quickly. Uh, I saw other companies who had such a long lead time, and I knew you know you could just see how human nature was going and how the world was going. It was easy to see when Amazon came on board and offered Amazon Prime and people were getting things shipped to them next day that people were going to start to expect that just about of everything. So we have prided ourselves on being really quick to turn around product. And this is the same thing with this. You can always find our product somewhere. Um, we do a lot of business with Red Hawk. So Red Hawk is one of those companies that you can go to. Always, they always keep them in stock. I mean, they buy they buy a lot of product from us. So. You can go about, you go to Red Hawk, or you can also come to our site. Sometimes we have a little bit more of a lead time. Red Hawk, you can always get them right away, but our our, our website um, uh, usually it's uh, a couple weeks bef before you can get um, a stock or a bottom metal. So even if you can, wanted to buy directly from us, it's still so much faster than uh, maybe getting it from some of the other competitors. Yeah, and I I mean some of them, and I won't say names, but they're. There are a couple stock manufacturers and you're still waiting that six to 10 months. And that's just not feasible anymore. I mean, a lot of the chassis manufacturers are in that 12 weeks and under. So that's good for you guys to be able to fit into that because I know a lot of people just don't have patience for it anymore, especially 
with the amount of available options there are out there. That's one of the biggest things. So kudos to you guys on that. Um, what, one of the big things that I've been asked, and honestly, I need to research more, but I figured I'd just talk to you about it and learn, and that's the reactor module. Now, a lot of people have heard about it. Um, I, I have heard about it, and I read your initial release on it, but I kind of want to know more about it. You know, why would I even need to buy it? Why would I use it? Um, what what purposes does it serve to really help me become a better shooter? Yeah, sure. So first, Reactor is a totally separate company. It's a company I started. We've got different ownership. It has nothing to do with Graybo, other than the fact that I'm the owner of both, or I have ownership in both. Um, so that's number one. Number two, Reactor is really a technology company that operates in the firearm space. So we make technology. We make a piece of hardware in, in a similar fashion, in analogous fashion, like a phone, like an iPhone, right? You make a piece of hardware that attaches to your rifle and it streams back live information to an app on your phone. And so what we do is we can, we, there's a few things that we deliver immediately uh, to the app, but the device um, will deliver cant, inclination, bearing, um, it'll count shots. So the shot counting feature is kind of like the hub of everything. It's what, what makes the device, it's what everything else spawns from, it's what gives everything else relevance. Um, we do weather, we do location, we do recoil profile, we do audio profile. We can do, and, um, we had one version that did temperature sensing. Um, we, this version that we just released does not have a temperature sensor, sensor built in because we we wanted to make it as modular as possible so that we couldn't guarantee where the temperature sensor was pointing, if that makes sense. So if you attach a, a piece of hardware to the outside of a stock, you can attach it to three, six, nine, or 12 anywhere on your stock, but I can't guarantee where your barrel's at. So we couldn't, we couldn't find a way to put that on there, but eventually we'll have an external little temperature sensor that you can put anywhere on your stock that points at the barrel and they'll Bluetooth to each other. So. Those are the things that we do. Um, the, uh, like I said, the hub is to count shots. So basically you attach it to your rifle and you sh start shooting and it just, it'll count every shot. And once it counts a shot, it, it collects all this other information that I mentioned to you and it logs it and delivers it to the customer in a timestamped fashion. So you have your shot, let's say it's at 7.32 and 32 seconds on whatever date. And along with that is your cant, your inclination, your bearing, your temperature outside, all your, all your temperature um, metrics. We pull in temperature from local weather station right now. Um, your recoil profile, your audio profile. Oh, and we just are launching a new one that is your muzzle rise. So um, all that basically, it's all that gets delivered to your phone and we're also creating a, um, a desktop app that's more powerful so that when you get home, you can start analyzing all this information. Now, that is, that is all the stuff that's built in to the device. And you, you have kind of asked a question about, well, how is it helpful to me? And the way mm -hmm. I answer that, I mean, and I'll get into some of the things that we do beyond that in a little bit, but how it, how it helps the shooter is that, so all of our accuracy and, and hinges on how well our ballistic calculator is fed information. So right now, if you take a shot and you human, a, a human cannot tell at the time of a shot what your cant is, like to any degree of accuracy at all. And so if you're shooting and your scope sitting above your bore, okay, is canted, well, the ballistic calculator assumes that your scope is directly above the line of your, of your barrel. That's how it calculates everything, right? That's kind of one of the premises of it, is that your scope is perfectly in line. That means your cant is zero. But I tell you from experience of shooting thousands of shots with the reactor fusion module, that my natural cant is somewhere around two and a half degrees canted to the right. Well, that will throw off every single one of my shots and then I will be putting inaccurate information into the ballistic calculator because it assumes zero. Now, ballistic some ballistic calculators have, a, have cant, um, 
field, some don't. And part of the reason why a lot of them don't is because it's almost impossible to accurately detect can't. So that's just one thing, but inclination is the same thing. If you don't know your inclination, inclination will affect your ballistics, especially at longer ranges, and so will bearing. So bearing will really only affect your, your, your accuracy at extreme long ranges, and it has to do with the Coriolis effect, and it has to do with the fact that the bullet is flying through the air as the earth rotates underneath it. So that doesn't really come into effect until you get into extreme long ranges, but it matters to some people. So those things right there are nearly impossible for the human without the help of technology to gather by themselves at the exact time of the shot. So that's the initial stuff that we deliver that's important. Um, and like I said, location. Um, so what we do with the location is that, that we can tell where you where you shot. So we have a map view that, that if you've shot in multiple places, you can see where you've shot. We know that the angle that you shot, so we can, and, and you can manually right now, manually enter the distance of your shot. So we can kind of triangulate shots for you. So, you know, without me having it here and trying to explain it just with words is harder, but um, we, uh, there's a lot of technology built in. There's a lot of really cool stuff that, that uh, we're going to do. And we're just kind of scratching the surface with this version one. The great thing about the fusion module and technology in general is that, we can send over the air updates. So when we come up with a new update, it's like free, like you get free. Um, it's not just like bug fixes. It's like if we incorporate something new, like we're working with a you know, specific ballistic calculator company to integrate a ballistic calculator into the app itself, that if you own the F uh, Fusion module, that will be a free over the air up update for you. And you will just, it'll just appear one day when you update your, your product. So. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's some of the ways that we're, uh, we're, we're trying to enhance the ability for the shooter to be smarter about, um, his or her shooting. I guess I got to take my mic off my, <laughs> that's, that's all the great information. And, you know, some shooters, I, I guess, don't need to know this information just because they don't care. But there are a lot of shooters that do care, and they do care about, you know, understanding what they're doing wrong from shot to shot. Um, I know I do that all the time. I'm like, and a lot of that's my fault because I don't practice enough. But I think this is one of those things that can kind of take a lot of people to the next level in understanding how they're shooting. Um, what? So these it looks like these are all the pre-orders are all sold out. Um, how many of these are out there right now? Um, there's Probably only uh, we have some in our possession, so that uh, you know we're testing. There's probably only like 20 or so out there. Um, we have another batch coming in uh, that we're going to be selling in November. Um, that'll be around 80, and so we'll sell those. And then we, you know when you have a new product like this, especially because there's really nobody else out there is doing anything like this, and it's a, it's a technology product. What you want to do is you want to get it out there and you want to get it tested and you want to get the bugs fixed. I mean, we're really this initial uh, sale that we did was kind of like our beta testers, right? So we want to get the, we want to get the bugs out and we want to be able to maintain if there's any little issues. And um, so far, I mean, things have, things have been pretty good. Um, then the next batch will be a little bigger. We'll get more out there. We'll have, you know, some control on the numbers. And then after that, I think we'll have enough data coming in on a consistent basis that will know that uh, our product is robust enough that we can pretty much just release it um, full bore. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, you, you had mentioned something that, you know, some shooters are not interested in. I'm, you and, and you're, you're probably right about that. I know you're right about that, um, that they don't, they're not interested in that. But our, one of our goals is like, I think what we can do is we can show people how, first of all, right now to be able to, track all the information that you need to track for your rifle is really a pain in the butt. If you do it by hand, it's a pain in the butt and people don't like doing it. And I don't even do it most of the time. And when I was in the military, I had to, but now I don't even do it most of the time because it is a pain in the butt. What we want to do is make it so easy that, and, and so intuitive and, and it delivers such information to the user in such an easy, di easily digestible way that people, everybody finds use in it somehow. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of our goals is like, it's the, the complexity of trying to understand long range shooting. I mean, you really have to spend a lot of time. Our goal is to hopefully come bring a product to the table that people can easily digest and understand and like, you know, I guess just have 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 really good solid information that makes sense where they don't they don't have to spend you know an enormous amount of time figuring out what's going on. Now we want to leave the shooting. We're leaving the shooting to the shooter, but we want to deliver the information to the shooter so that shooter can take that information and try to understand how to become better. You know, we're not trying to take over. I know there's been some firearm systems in the past that basically take over the rifle for you. You know. I don't think that's the way to do it. I don't think, I think the person who's, um, who's behind the gun should be pulling the trigger and the trigger and the bullet should go bang. The gun should go bang when you pull the trigger. I think that's the way, to, that's the way that that should happen. But mm -hmm. delivering as much useful information, easily digestible information as fast as we can, I think is key. And I think people, there's a lot of people out there that I think will, will take to that, that wouldn't have before. And my hope is that that helps to grow the, that part of the industry because it's a cool part of the industry, but it, it, it's, first of all, it's an expensive part of the industry. And, and second, it's, it's really complex. It's the most complex. So it takes, takes time. So if we can minimize that time a little bit, maybe we get more people shooting long range. Right. You know, and it is growing extremely fast. Um, how, how easy is this to swap between guns? So, if you've got a setup, do you have to completely redo everything to set it up on another gun, or how does that work? Um, no, it's it's a it's adapted. So there's a there's an adapter that hooks to your M lock. As you see in that picture that you have up there of the reactor on the if that's on the Neo, um, we have an adapter that goes right onto your M lock, and then you slide the fusion module, and it clips on. So you can buy. Five, if you have five rifles, you can buy five different M-Lock adapters, put the M-Lock adapter on the M-Lock on your stock, and literally there's a toggle switch. You can kind of see it. It's right behind the reactor logo. You can kind of see it popping its head out right there. Yep. You push that down, and you, it releases, and you put it on the next one. And in the app, yeah, you can see it a little bit better. Yeah, there's the, that's, the, um, that's the adapter right there. So basically... You, the, um, the screws that you see, you can see the M-Lock T-nuts on the bottom. Those will just attach right into the M-Lock slot. And then you'll have this piece um, sitting on your uh, on your uh, M-Lock on your stock. And all you got to do is slide the fusion module right on there. And you can go from uh, rifle to rifle. And in the, um, in the app, you can, you can select and, and record as many rifles as you want and re many rifle ammo combinations as you want. So if you have 100 rifles and you want to enter them all in on one fusion module, you can do that. And you want to switch them from a, you can do that. Um, yeah, it's, and it's, you could even break this down. Like if you're in a PRS match, you could break this down from stage to stage, right? And then kind of print it out and see exactly if you're canning over, or if you're doing any of that stuff, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's... That's going to be big for a lot of these guys that are trying to get the, you know, a little bit bigger edge that have a lot of time to practice and different things. So this might be really good for them. And it might be good. It, I know it's going to be good for somebody like me to understand exactly what I'm doing. Now, is this something that you could do some sort of real time? So like Sam hunting and there's a deer, it's up a certain incline. Now, a lot of that stuff is built into range finders and stuff. It gives you the incline and then you've got to pull it back off. Um, to be able to, uh, you know, figure out exactly what your yardage is and make the correction. Is this something that could do that sort of real time and give you that that data to where you could have the incline and everything already into it? Or how, how would you think that could work with hunting where you're trying to do it in a really fast scenario? We have what's called a heads-up display screen. So that heads-up display gives you real time. Um, I don't know. It might be on the website, too, if, um, if you look. Uh, let's see. Let's go to yeah home. Let's scroll down. Um, yeah, so right there. So the second one from the left, you can see, kind of looks like a cockpit thing. Um, uh, all this. Yep. Yeah, that one. That's what's called the heads-up display, and you can see on there in the middle. That'll mm -hmm. give you a cant. So right now the cant, it's very small on my screen. But what is that? Negative one point zero. 
So that's your six. Yeah, six. Okay? And, and then um, your your inclination, you can see the inclination um, are, is on the right. So you can see 30, 20, 10, 0, negative 10, negative 20. So you can see where your, your inclination is. So that center yeah. line, yep, right there, that center line will tell you exactly. And then your bearing is up on top. You can see it's we're just off of north there. Um, yep, sure. And, yep, and then the three, um, the three digits or the three uh, numerical entries on top of the fields, those are the actual values of your cant inclination and heading right there. So if you don't want to look at the, you know, the um, heads up display view kind of, you can just look at those numbers and that'll give them to you in a numerical form. Um, that number down there is barrel temperature. That was probably taken when we had the barrel temperature built in. Does that say barrel temperature? It's hard for me to see. Yeah, or yeah, barrel temperature. Yeah, so how so you guys redoing this to where now that part just goes onto the barrel so it gives you an, a more accurate readout? Is that what you're saying? Well, no. Um, our initial uh, Fusion module, which we never launched, was built to go on an M lock, but on the inside of the stock right underneath the barrel. And we did that um, so that we could have a direct line of sight to the barrel. But what we found is it limited us too much on first of all, being able to swap out the fusion module because if your barreled action is sitting on in your stock and your fusion module sandwiched in between your stock and your barreled, barreled action, you have to take your barreled action out of the stock every time to move it. Number one, number two, it's not as, um, the way we made it wasn't as universal. There was a lot of people that we found that needed to you know, attach it to a Picatinny rail or something and then we couldn't do that. So we ended up, scratching that version and when we made the second one we our goal was to make it more modular we wanted to make it adaptable to an m-lock and a picatinny and we wanted to put it on the outside so that it could be easily swapped the negative part about that was that we couldn't guarantee where that fusion module was going to be and then therefore we couldn't guarantee that we could have a good line of sight from the fusion module to the barrel and therefore read that temperature so what we're what we decided to do is we'll make an external piece, hardware piece that all it is is a barrel temperature sensor that you can mount to your stock through an M lock or something like that, and it'll Bluetooth to the device itself. It doesn't have to be hardwired. It doesn't even have to be on on the chip on the Fusion module. It can just it can just Bluetooth. So that's that was kind of our workaround. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of information. I'm gonna have to definitely look into more more of this because I was looking. And that's the thing that kind of got me confused because I was looking on the Grebo side. I'm like, well, it's not even on here. Where the heck did it go? And then when you said, yeah, it's a different company, I went, crap. It's probably because I'm not looking in the right place for it. So that was my fault for not doing it. So that that is a lot of a lot of information on the react, reactor. Uh, yeah. Do you know when in November it's going out? Um, we're building them right now. Um, the last piece of the last piece is coming off the machine tomorrow. Actually, being lasered tomorrow. And we're building them, probably build them uh, next week, the week after, and then we'll probably launch them. That'll be, what, second week in November or so, like that, probably. So yeah. I'll put something out um, on, our, on our Facebook page and Instagram and all that, all that stuff, and, and I'll, I'll let people know. Okay, good deal. So let's, let's hit run back to Grable real quick before we get out of here. Um, now, you, you guys have got your swag on here. Um, I've got my gray bow hat on um you got shirts you've got and that's one thing i wanted to know to mention you guys have done a really good job i this is one of my favorite shirts i wear this one all the time bold actions speak louder than words um so go check out their website under swag go check out their website period um because then you can get resources about us articles everything you need to know about gray bow um i think you know it's going to be one of those to watch within the industry and uh, I'm kind of excited to where you're going. I'm really excited to see what this new stock is all about. Cause you know, from what I've heard about the Phoenix, it's been nothing but phenomenal. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, whatever else you guys release is going to be the same. So I'm excited to see that. And hopefully long range tactics can get their hands on one that we can kind of play with. So yeah, absolutely. when we, when we re uh, release it, we'll make sure we get you guys one. You guys did a great job with the, with the, with the Phoenix. So we appreciate that. Yep, and that's just the beginning. I know he's got a couple more that he wants to do on it, and we appreciate you guys working with us, um, you know, being a new review place. So 
Um, is there anything else that we've missed that you kind of want to hit on? Because I, I know a lot of people have questions. Um, so what other things can we hit real quick that might answer some of the questions that you guys get a lot? That we get a lot. We, uh, hmm. And again, if, if anybody is on oh. here, or if you're listening on the podcast and you want to ask them questions, uh, go to the website, you know, there's a contact us or go to their social media and hit them up. But I mean, if there's anything that you want to hit on real quick, we can hit on it. Um, yeah. The most, the questions we get asked most are when are we coming out with new inlets? That's by far every, we get, I would say dozens of those questions every week on between social media and, and emails. Um, and the, these questions have been persistent for years. So finally though, We've been saying, you know, we've been saying six months or whatever for three years, and we apologize about that. It's really difficult. It was really difficult for us to get to the point where we could, we could, we felt comfortable doing new inlets just because of our process. But I will say that we already have a Tika inlet, a stock, a Phoenix Tika inlet. What I mean is that a stock that we put a Tika in and it fits and it works. So we're just refining that process a little bit right now, making sure that we're, you know, the, the machining process is, is going. Um, we will follow that with Savage. We'll probably do a Ruger American. Um, what else? There's others too. I can't, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but we'll probably think there's like four or five different inlets that we'll do. So Tika, Savage, Ruger American. I'm missing like two, probably a Mossberg. Um, that's the other so one. You're, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have a lot of options. We're gonna, have, we're gonna have some options, and so um, that'll be coming soon. That is one of our big initiatives um, coming up. We've already started. That'll hit kind of at the end of this year, and it'll go all the way probably through next year. We've hired people. We've spent money on this. Like it's it's a uh, it's an initiative that we're we're serious about and that we'll follow through with for sure this time. So just to let you guys know, I know that there's been a lot of people asking for a long time about alternative inlets. So it is finally coming. Yeah. And and I wanted to hit this real quick before we go. There is, you guys do have an ultralight version of a hunting stock. Um, and I believe it's, it's the outlander version like this, only it's carbon fiber, right? Is yeah. That it's a different material. Yeah. Formulation, um, that we, that we were able to formulate. Um, and, and so it's, we advertise it as 27 ounces. Yeah. And that's the one that we just recently put on our new budget build for boring is right on them. Um, you know, it's one of those budget friendly, uh, rifle stocks that I think you're going to really, really like, um, the, the quality is there, the colors there. I can testify cause I have, I don't know, four or five gray bows now. And I really enjoy them. Um, and I appreciate you coming on tonight. I know you're a busy man. Um, we appreciate the, you know, the, the insights that we've got into gray bow. And I know some of you are going to have more questions. So again, go to their Facebook, um, go to reactor. Reactor is a different page. If you want to learn more about that. Um, and I, I appreciate it, Ryan. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, man. It was fun. Thanks for having me. Send us your questions or topics and we'll cover the show. Thanks for listening.